Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, session, um, The Digital Euro, A Work in Progress. My name is Roland Sheridan, and I am delighted to be your moderator today. Um, firstly, by way of a short introduction, and ever since we launched the Digital Euro project, uh, the ECB has been identifying the appropriate design options to provide Europeans with a stable, secure, and convenient digital currency. And so it's really important for us to regularly engage with you as representatives of civil society, to both understand your views, to get your questions and comments, and also to share with you an update on where we are with the project, and also uh, some insights on where we might be going. And a number of you may have already attended our first session, the first seminar on the Digital Euro back in June 2022, about six months ago. And so it's really important that we get your feedback and your comments, and we really, really very much welcome it. So it's our pleasure to be here with you today. We'll talk again about uh, all things digital Europe. And just a couple of short, sort of, um, how would I put it, uh, housekeeping kind of things to observe before we get started. One, we will have an online poll after we have the presentation from my colleagues here. We'll have an online poll so that you can tell us which of the, of the topics you would most like to hear about. And then when we get the opportunity to do so, we can have a bit more in-depth discussion about that those two topics, and then we'll have some time at the end for kind of a more general Q&A where you can address any comments or questions you have without any of the things we have not talked about. And then secondly, with regard to housekeeping, uh, just we would ask that um, you keep your microphones on mute, unless of course we're speaking, and if you have any issues with regard to technical issues, please just address them in the chat to the host, and my the colleagues and the team will um, come to you right away. Uh, two other things to mention. One is that we would like, if you can, to put your, ask that you um, you put your cameras on, so that we kind of feel that's kind of a, a good way for us to try and enrich the discussion and the interactive element of, of the session. And finally, to note that the session is being recorded and it will go on our website uh, in the next coming days. So just to be aware of that as well. And with all that out of the way, then I think we can get on to the seminar and um, proper. So it's a uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce them. Um, Evelyn Whitlocks, who is leading the Digital Euro project here in the ECB, and she's also joined by Jurgen Schaaf, who is um, in charge of the communication aspects of the Digital Euro. So with that out of the way, I thank you very much. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here again. Uh, we had been in contact uh, uh, in June last year, um, so it's good to give another update on where we are, and I uh, would really uh, like to. Uh, uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion we will have afterwards. So let me uh, uh, go through a couple of slides just to introduce the topic and to show where we are currently, and then, as uh, was explained, we will open the floor uh, for a discussion. Um, if we go to the next slide. Then uh, here you see the agenda. So we want to uh, start uh, giving this a little bit of uh, the framework. So why are we considering digital euro and also what are the timelines that we are working with? Uh, and then we go into a little bit more depth on the uh, design choices that we are going to uh, have been discussing. So first, where could the digital euro be used? Uh, some of the more in-depth design choices. Privacy, of course, being a very important one. Uh, role of intermediaries, uh, uh, and then um, uh, the uh, ensuring of the usability of the digital euro, the scheme approach it might sound uh, a little bit technical, but I hope I can explain better in the slides. Financial inclusion is an important topic, and then uh, a digital euro for the future. So with that, uh, let me go into the digital euro framework. Um, and if we then... Uh, start, let's, and that makes sense, is what is the digital euro? So the digital euro would be a uh, liability for retail payments of citizens and business areas in the entire euro area. Um, that sounds very technical, um, but uh, let me explain. Uh, for example, cash is also a central bank liability. Right? If you have a bank note, it's a liability of the central bank. And uh, the digital euro will be a digital uh, version of this kind of liability, and it's aimed at retail payments. So the payments that you do as uh, as a citizen to uh, to businesses. So it's not about uh, uh, payments, for example, big payments between businesses. 
and it's about the entire euro area. So we want to have the ability to pay in the entire euro area. A couple of important messages that we uh, have said before, but we want to keep on uh, stressing. So it's a complement to what is currently there. So it's not substituting cash, and it's not substituting wholesale central bank deposit. Um, also, um, the supervised intermediaries, so that will be banks and payment service providers, will facilitate the distribution of the digital euro. So you will not get into a contact with the, the, the central bank and, and, and go and open your account here. You will do that by supervised intermediaries. And finally, but not last, we see the digital euro as a source of innovation and a public good. So, uh, therefore, it shall, of course, not crowd out banks and also not hinder innovation in credit. If we then go to the next slide, um, we are currently in the investigation phase that started in Q4 2021. Um, and then we have spent 2022 roughly on uh, all kinds of separate elements of the digital euro that you need to consider. So, for example, in which use case it would be used. Or uh, what would be the role of intermediaries? Uh, or what would be the level of privacy that we could foresee? But also, would it be an offline or would it be an online digital world? We still need to finalize some of these decisions uh, by the end of Q1. Uh, and then in Q2, we want to use this as a holistic review. So then we bring together all these separate decisions, and we can take one full end to end view of the digital euro. And then we're going to review this. And if I say we, that will be uh, the euro system, but in consultation, in discussion with the market, as we have also done for all the other separate uh, uh, decisions. So um, there we have worked in a way where we have done first some internal analysis, uh, went out to the market to, to stakeholders to, uh, to get their feedback, incorporate that, and then render that to more final decisions. This we will do again in the holistic review. There are still uh, decisions that we have taken for a separate uh, design decision could be reviewed and revisited. Uh, and that will be the content then that we will bring to the governing council, uh, which is planned now for 2023, 2023 in the autumn, um, where uh, we will go back with uh, the outcome of the investigation phase and then advise whether or not to go to a realization phase, to the next phase, and of course, if so, how that phase should look like. When we go to the next slide, um, here you see how we do the stakeholder management. So how do we make sure that we are not in an ivory tower deciding on the digital euro? Um, but as you can see, we are really interacting uh, with uh, all our major uh, stakeholders. So in the middle part, you see the structure we have within the euro system. So uh, you have the ECB project team with national central banks joining. Then we have a steering committee. And then in the end, we go to the executive board and the governing council. But before we go there, we align on the right-hand side with market stakeholders. We have uh, different ways to do so. So we have a market advisory group where we have invited experts from the market uh, to be in an advisory role and their personal titles are not representing the companies or institutions that they work for, uh, but on their personal expertise. Then we have the Euro Retail Payments Board uh, that uh, is already consisted, consisting of the major stakeholders that we have in the retail payments uh, space. And there, as I explained before, we present our design decisions uh, or solutions and then we get their feedback and then we go into a dialogue on uh, how this uh, uh, PPC or PPC uh, uh, improved. And then we have also the reach out to uh, special interest group. Um, the ECB also consults uh, public and citizens. So in addition to what I said before, so we have done a public consultation already. We work with focus groups. So we have done an exercise uh, at the end of last year. And we are uh, also at the end of 2021. Uh, and we are now finalizing the second uh, round of focus groups in which we will publish at uh, the beginning of Q2. Um, we have exchanges with CSOs, we have lectures, discussions with students, uh, uh, and of course, um, in this whole market environment, 
uh, this uh, uh, seminar is also an important platform for us. And on the right uh, left hand side, uh, you see the interaction we have with the political stakeholders. So uh, we have a conflict group together with the European Council, but we go very regularly, and if I say we, it's uh, Mr. Panetta to the European Parliament to update them on, uh, on the progress that we made, uh, as well as to the Euro group uh, where we uh, report to. And then we can go to the next slide. Thank you very much. Uh, so more on uh, uh, the, the content of the digital world. So first of all, it's important to understand where the digital world will be used. Uh, and here in this picture, you see uh, five different use cases, high-level use cases that we can consider, uh, of which we have chosen for the first releases three. So that will be person-to-person -person payments, because that's of very close to the situation where we can use cash. Consumer to business, uh, both in physical store as on e commerce, and also uh, uh, person uh, to government and by government. The other ones are, of course, also interested that could be uh, of interest for later uh, for the development in the digital world, but are currently not in scope for the first releases. We then go to the next slide. Um, then you see something more on the design choices. Um, and uh, as I said before, there are quite a number of design choices that we need to make in order to have addressed all the elements of the Wikipedia where we could think of. Um, the first two sets you see with the uh, blue square, um, we currently finalized uh, and we published on them. Uh, you see a link here to the two reports that we published. One was in September and the other one was uh, in December. And we're currently working on the third set uh, where we hope to uh, come to a decision in, in uh, group one from the industry. And that said, this will be the input on, uh, on the digital digital euro uh, in, in the holistic review that we are planning to do in the group next year, uh, this year. If we go to the next slide, uh, and a couple of important uh, things that we had uh, decided. So, as I already said before, so we consider to think uh, to develop an online solution uh, validated by third party. This is a kind of payment that you uh, currently uh, can already do. Uh, for example, if you do a car payment, uh, um, these are going via a network via uh, and to be validated by third party. Also good to mention that uh, also in, in DOT or blockchain solutions, this is normally an online uh, solution where you have a third party validator. Then what we will uh, also uh, uh, issue uh, then would be an offline peer-to-peer -peer validated solution. So that would be closer to that, uh, where you could have two devices and then between these two devices you can pay without any what we have excluded is the peer to peer validate online because it's still experimental at this time. Then uh, you see uh, on privacy, privacy is extremely important for us. Um, uh, so we want to uh, deliver this to you uh, with the highest level of privacy that is possible. As you can understand, we need to find uh, a, a balance between, on one side, the privacy. And the right on privacy, and on the other side, uh, the fight against uh, AUC4. Um, important to mention that the way we design the system would be uh, that we will, as a euro system, have uh, no personal data, uh, and for that, we are experimenting with uh, privacy and matching techniques. Uh, intermediaries would know. Uh, see uh, transaction data in order to do AML CFT uh, transactions. Um, and uh, we are still in discussion because privacy uh, is in the end uh, up to the legislature to uh, kind of decide upon. So we're uh, uh, discussing with them whether it could be foreseen that lower value payments uh, can have uh, no or uh, very limited AML CFT. The last point, I'm going to dive into much detail there, but it's also that we want to control the amount of digital euro circulation in order to ensure financial stability. And there we're considering holding limit options 
uh, and remuneration uh, methods. The schools are currently only uh, decided upon that we will implement them in the design. And we would go through a realization phase which tools to use, but also the parameters for these tools will only be decided much closer to a possible issue. We then go to uh, the next slide on privacy. I think I have said a lot of that already, uh, but uh, some things are always good to, to, to uh, stress. So, privacy, as you could have seen, was one of the first topics that we addressed because we think that the digital world should ensure privacy by default and by design. Uh, we find it important that people have control over their personal data and, and money. Um, as I said before, no access to personal data, uh, the balance between A and C of T. Uh, offline, I think it would be good to stress a little bit better that we think that offline digital Europe could provide to a degree of privacy close to cash. As I said before, it's a clear to clear validated transaction. So, like with a banknote, if I give a banknote to my a colleague or a, 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 a friend, and there's no one in between. With offline, that would be the same. Uh, and potentially, it could cater therefore for the highest level of privacy. Um, and then, uh, important to mention, uh, it's not directly related to privacy, but uh, it's important to, to stress that the digital euro won't be programmable money. So, uh, um, it's like with a bank note, it's like with all the other euros that are issued by the central bank. It's a money and it cannot be programmable, and that's the same for the digital euro. If we then go to the next slide, uh, role of intermediaries, um, it's of course important uh, next to the financial stability that we also ensure that the, the whole ecosystem is not disrupted. Therefore, we foresee a big role of, uh, for the supervised intermediaries. Uh, they will perform uh, um, quite a number of tasks that they think we are already doing. So they do the end user onboarding, they service the end user. Um, if you uh, the initiation of the payment and validation will be done by the supervised intermediary settlement, uh, like it is also, for example, um, now is done by the euro system, and then the post settlement transaction is done again by the supervised intermediary. Um, I think with that, I will accept everything you say in this slide. If we go to the next slide, um, the scheme approach. Um, and the scheme approach is very much about making sure that the digital euro, like a banknote, can be used all over Europe. Um, and in order to, to do so, we need to make sure that if you get a digital euro from an intermediary uh, in a certain European country, let's say you come from, uh, from Spain, uh, you get the, you have a bank in Spain, you get the you have your digital euro account there, you get your payments needs from this bank in Spain. But then if you travel to any other con Euro country, so the Netherlands or Germany or Italy, uh, you should be able to pay with this means of payment uh, uh, at any merchant. Uh, in order to make sure that this is possible, we need to set common rule standards uh, that are similar across the pan uh, Euro area uh, in order to promote this harmonized and user payment experience. Apart from you know, standardization and harmonization uh, of these, uh, uh, these interactions at the point of interaction, the scheme approach still leaves a lot of flexibility uh, and freedom uh, for, for other providers uh, to uh, develop in a different and solution to the approach for you. We are planning to start this uh, uh, digital euro scheme work. Um, uh, mid February, we hope to do the kickoff. We have hired a scheme robot manager who was appointed on the 1st of December. And in the beginning of January, we issued uh, a call for interest to enable us to set up this group where public and private sector participants together work on this uh, scheme. We then go to the next slide uh, on financial improvement. It's an important topic. 
So um, we believe that the digital world should, of course, facilitate financial inclusion. Um, there are lots of reasons why people are financially excluded. We might not be able to reward all of them, but everything that would be in our remit, we will uh, consider. So, for example, uh, a digital euro can include the access to digital financial services. Uh, we can ensure that everybody can pay and get paid with the digital euro. It will enhance the efficiency of digital payments uh, and lower costs. Uh, the offline part is important. Um, we believe it can facilitate the enrollment and the education, and a lot of not least, to foster interoperability uh, and to facilitate the homogeneous and digital experience. And then if we go to the last, uh, and that is the digital euro for the future. So uh, the digital euro is still a work in progress. I hope I have been clear that. We have done a lot in the last uh, one and a half year, uh, but there's still a lot of work uh, ahead of us, uh, which we are not doing on our own, uh, but we really uh, do this uh, with all stakeholders around us, both in the Digital Euro program as well as in the world of work. Um, we see that people payment behavior is changing, and what we see is that there is a downward trend in cash usage in the Digital Euro area. So we believe that it's uh, important uh, that there is also a digital euro that could enhance the digital progress and integration in Europe. Um, we believe that the ECB has been uh, responsible for preserving the citizens' trust in our currency and that we can also and should also transport this into the digital age. Uh, and we believe that the digital euro would, would be accessible to all. Uh, that is how we would design it, uh, and it will increase the, uh, the the choice that people have in how they want to make that payment. And with that, we come to the end of the presentation. Um, and then I think we will go to the voting. Yes, thanks, Evelyn. Thanks very much for that. Yeah, so we mentioned at the start that we would have a, a quick poll, and we really want to use this to choose between some of the, the things you heard about there and uh, focus on the top two topics that, that we can identify. Then we'll take time to uh, take the comments and your questions and uh, give them over in those particular areas. So on your screen now, on your WebEx uh, uh, view, um, you should see a question um, come up uh, and uh, instructions on how to answer a quick poll. So what we're asking here is that if it doesn't come up straight away, by the way, please um, just make sure you're on the Slido window and the drop down menus on the WebEx screen, and you should see it then. If you don't see it there, then um, there should be a QR code that you can scan with the mobile device as well. So you can choose between the four of these options. So privacy, design choices, role of intermediaries, and the scheme approach. And so when you get a chance to, uh, to, to vote on, on that, uh, you choose the ones that you are the one that, that you most want to hear from today. Then we pick the top two, and then when we do that, as I said, we spend a bit more time speaking about those. We should have time at the end of this, as I said at the start, to then have a wider conversation for the things that we've been so far. So uh, already, from what I can see uh, coming through, privacy seems to be um, far and away the one, uh, unless you know, we have put the answer so far. Uh, it seems to be the only three the, the, the kind of main um, one that people want to talk about. So certainly, um, perhaps we can already begin to think about that. And then uh, also coming to think as well is that the role of intermediaries looks like something people want to talk about as well. So with that in mind, then, um, then I think we take those at the top of the three topics. So if we start with privacy, and as you heard from Evelyn already, we have kind of known from when we began um, this project in the digital era. Privacy is a really uh, huge topic for us, and that you know it's something that we, we, we very much want to and um, we very much value. We're very much aware, and as you heard already from Evelyn, it's a it's a really core for us that you know privacy by default and design is kind of key to to how this um, with each of you will be included. So so maybe already, then you can begin um, to uh, raise your hands and ask for any questions that anyone wants to ask us. Please raise your virtual hand, and then we will. Uh, Mutual questions. So, let's say it's uh, it is definitely a topic which we have 
we have certainly been speaking about before, and I think it's clear that it's, it's so um, related to how people use cash, even. And as we said, the digital world is very much the complement of cash. So, thinking that we can, we know this very important part of it. So, I don't know if anyone has any questions to start us off. Maybe anyone who has a, who had chosen privacy to pick us off with, with a question, comment, did not be a question. Everyone, all very quiet. Maybe while we're, while we're waiting, um, uh, I mean, in terms of how Evelyn, we see the privacy as a concept in terms of cash. Do you, I mean, the question then for me in a way that perhaps us maybe start this process, but you see it as something which kind of one for one, like how we see cash, how we see the digital as a complement of cash, and very much something which can be used to sort of, uh, doesn't replace cash. Um, do you see the, any differences between how we can apply privacy? For cash and Hollywood and Village of Frank Privacy for digital euro. There's, there's a big difference between cash and digital euro, and that's because of the digital euro, mm. because that it's digital. Yeah. So with cash, you hold something in your hand, but if you digital, you need to put it on something that it's mm. digital. So that makes it by nature that we cannot make it one on one exactly the same yeah. uh, because of the digital nature. Uh, but um, uh, as I said, that, uh, um, with offline, um, we, we do think that our, we are closest to cash, as I said before, mm -hmm. because um, it will be on something you hold, and can be a card or can be on your phone. We still need to really deep dive into the technical uh, background and the solutions that are there. Um, because we also need to make sure that it's really safe. Uh, and then, um, uh, but you can exchange that without a third party in between. So that, that is really, really, really uh, uh, a great so. Okay, then um, I think we might have a question in the chat. Uh, I don't see it right yet now. So, I mean, the person who raised the question, feel free indeed to, to kind of unmute yourself and ask the question directly if you'd like. But otherwise, um, uh, okay, yes, yeah, so great. We have a question from Louis Yaru. And Louis, please feel free to unmute yourself and answer question. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity to ask the first question. So, uh, my question concerns the exact uh, guarantees um, you have in mind to. Um, preserve privacy uh, you have you have you have been quite quick on this and especially uh regarding the fact that um, i mean as it is now the project would rely on intermediaries so there will be privacy issues at the level of the central bank but also at the level of intermediaries and uh, i mean i i don't know who these intermediaries will be but currently uh, commercial banks for instance they have some requirements uh, regarding Tax issues, for instance. Um, how do you how do you th how do you um, think about guarantees um, so that like the, the digital euro will be maybe more private than traditional uh, commercial accounts? Uh, I would say. I hope my my question is is clear. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for for this question, and it's a it's a clear uh, question. Um, so, so let me uh, distinguish uh, two things. So you're very right. So there is a there's on uh, the question on how uh, what data is shared at the intermediary level and what data is shared uh, uh, within the central bank. Um, so to let let me start with the last one. Um, so we are currently really uh, investigating uh, how we if we could foresee a technical setup. 
where we can do the settlement and all the tasks that we need to do in order to make sure that the digital euro is both issued, but also that we can pay in digital euros and uh, that, the, that those transactions are settled in a way uh, that the central bank of our system wouldn't need any personal data. So that we design it in a way that this data is not even entering our system. So that even if somebody would want to see it, it, it couldn't because we don't have the data. So that is something that we are doing on the, on the central bank side. In the design, we're investigating uh, uh, how we could do this. Uh, as I said before, we need to find a ba balance between AML, CXT, and fighting fraud on the one hand, and the, uh, on, on the other hand, uh, uh, the right of privacy. So for now, it's foreseen, uh, at least by us, uh, that the intermediaries would have access to the data because of the rules, uh, because they need to comply to AML, CFP, also for the digital euro. Um, since digital euro legislation still needs to be drafted, we are discussing with the legislator if we, they could foresee, for example, uh, some room to have uh, a lower transaction monitoring, for example, on low value transactions. But uh, it's still a discussion, and in the end, it's also the legislator that will decide upon this level of, uh, of privacy. Uh, so, this is very much also a debate uh, uh, around the draft legislation that is going to be uh, ongoing. Thank you. Thank you, Louis. And um, anyone? Oh, okay, Brett. Yes, uh, I see the Brett Scott has a question. Yeah, please go ahead, Brett. Please ask your question. So my, my original um, encounters with CBDC were in 2015 with monetary reform groups who wanted to basically kneecap the banking sector by providing a form of state competition to the digital deposit system the banking sector runs, right? And what I'm always interested in here when you're talking about your sort of relationship with intermediaries is what is the political relationship right now with the how does the banking sector perceive the digital euro? And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of interested, interested in the sort of the cloaked language that I see around sort of like the waterfall and this kind of stuff. I want to know what is that waterfall and what is the sort of the engagement that you're having with the banking sector right now about protecting their interests, essentially? Um, that's a my question. <laughs> uh... So um, I, I, let's park the waterfall because I think that was a slightly different uh, topic, uh, but I can come back to that if, if you want. Um, so um, on, with, the, with the intermediary, we are in, in close uh, uh, contact uh, in order for the design, um, because as we said, we want them to be the distribution of the digital euro. Um, and um, as I think with all stakeholders, there are some uh, pros that they see, but there are also some concerns that they have. So we talk about both of them. Um, so I think what, if we talk on, uh, with, the, with the banks, we, we discuss uh, the design itself. So how could it be attractive for the end users and therefore also for, for the banks? Um, but also they raise some questions about, for example, the financial stability, uh, because some of the liquidity will, will move. Uh, and that's also why we uh, uh, have addressed the, the tiers to control the amount of circulation uh, rather early in the project uh, in order uh, to give comfort there. Um, because on both sides, financial stability is as important for us uh, as for that. I hope that has answered some of the questions. Great. Thank you very much, Brett. Um, so then we have a question in the chat from Martin Schmalzfried. So the question is, do you intend to revise anti-money laundering rules to enable people to use basic non-custodial digital euro accounts? No need for any no euro customer process. To help tackle financial exclusion, notably of certain nationalized groups not documented in the case. Thank you for, for the question. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, first of all, uh, on, on, on the, the rules or, or the law, in, it will be uh, at the legislature that does it. So it's not the ECB that can set these rules uh, or can change these rules. Uh, we will need to object to this rule. So it's also to be clear on that. Um, so, so far, we have uh, said 
uh, from the Europe systems perspective, that we would foresee not a uh, full anonymity. So that would mean that a certain level of KYC uh, needs to be done. However, financial inclusion uh, um, is important. And so, uh, like for example, uh, immigrants and things are um, close to the heart of all is something to look into how we could do that, maybe not specifically for the digital or what on the wider part, but on uh, the rules for privacy. And um, this is something that is in, that is in the legislature um, area. As a, as a starting point, we have said that from our perspective, full anonymity should be ruled out so that we also should always know that somebody holds the digital and account and, uh, and not that we need to know, so I need to be more clear. So the, the European Central Bank will not know, but we need to make sure that an intermediary does the KYC when they enter somebody in the digital user. Great, uh, thanks for that. So we have a question then now from Katrin Latch. Katrin, uh, I see you on the screen, so please go ahead with your question or comment. Yes. I read that um, you had a um, cooperation with Amazon testing CBDC, and I would like to know how um, would you make sure that Amazon, for example, would respect and obey uh, European privacy laws and that it, in the end, would not be the American privacy law? Uh, the, the digital euro will follow the European laws and not the American uh, uh, laws. Um, and I, I know that when we announced uh, the, the participants to the prototyping where Amazon was one of the providers, it raised a lot of concerns. I just want to say a couple of things on that. So uh, the, the prototyping is really a learning experience. Um, we have published everything that we have shared with not only Amazon, there were four other uh, European companies that participating as well. Um, uh, all the information that we have shared with them, we have, we're not doing anything with real data. So at this point in time, it's only uh, um, fictional data that, we, that is, is used. Um, so, so that I just want to give some uh, insurance that the participation uh, from any of the providers in the, in the prototyping doesn't go uh, beyond the prototyping uh, as such. And all the privacy rules that will be imposed for the digital euro will be for all uh, that belongs to the digital euro. Thanks, Katrin. Um, then there's a question in the chat as well from Ben Kukupe from Finance Watch. I was wondering if there could be a greater elaboration of what privacy guidelines will be considered now. Very well. Question. Yes. In <laughs> case you want to be more specific uh, while we're discussing this. Um, well, let, um, let me try to start with, a, with an answer. I mean, uh, is that um, they're actually so when we discuss privacy with stakeholders, uh, we actually normally get two kinds of questions. And one is, um, what will the central bank know? Uh, uh, and on the other hand, what will the, the, the end-to-end privacy uh, uh, be? So I think those are the two levels. As I said before, on the, on the what information will the central bank know? We are currently uh, designing the system in a way um, that that we uh, will not have any personal data. So that is that is one important one. And uh, in the other privacy guidelines, a couple of things that we have said. Uh, so we have said from a real system perspective, we would rule out uh, full anonymity. Uh, that means that if, if somebody wants to have a digital your account, they need to go through a KYC process uh, at the supervised intermediary. Uh, and that uh, transaction data will be um, uh, monitored by supervised intermediaries. For the only reason that they could do this is because of uh, for ANC purposes. And then the last thing uh, is that um, 
we are further discussing whether we, you know, the legislator sees room to uh, allow a higher level of privacy for lower value transactions. Um, I hope I've been answering the question, and if not, please uh, uh, raise your hand and follow up question. Okay, so then we have a couple more questions now, and we had allocated the base. Five, five minutes to each of these departments. I think we have a couple more questions here. Let's let's put these questions now, and then we um, can and move on in a second. The role of the meeting. So, Brett has a question. Brett, please go ahead. Um, so, you made a point about stressing that you're not trying to compete with the physical cash system, but I'm skeptical about the political reality of that whether in practice actually the sort of hype around cbc contributes to the broader kind of digital hype more generally all right and i'm guessing when i'm looking at the sort of politics you talk about players like amazon players like amazon hate the cash system precisely because they can't automate it so to what extent do you really see yourself as let's say playing into the broader interests of transnational corporates that require digital automation <laughs> Versus the interests of the public who actually might not want everything to be automated. And in many ways, the cash system is the kind of public bicycle of payments versus the Uber of payments. Where do you kind of actually place the, the CBDC in there? Do you see it as a way to basically empower digital corporates? Or are you trying to simultaneously promote the physical cash system as well? Well, I think we have to be very clear. So we stay fully committed to cash. Uh, so this is, this is really only complementary. What we do see, and that is not in the hands of the ECB, and it's also not for the ECB to, to, to determine, is that uh, uh, people more and more like to pay in a digital uh, um, means of payment. So we just published the space report, uh, where you saw that in the, the number of transactions, retail payment transactions that have been done with cash was lowered in three years' time from 73% to 59 now by heart. Um, so we see a, a tendency, uh, and also in, when asking people what they, how they would like to uh, pay, you see a growing um, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, do you say? Uh, a growing attraction of wanting to pay digitally. Having said that, they have also clearly indicated that they would like to have and uh, continue to have the access to cash. So um, I think that the, in our view, with keeping committed, being committed to uh, cash, and next to that, have a complementary digital euro, which will uh, uh, empower, because we want to make this an, as, as uh, user-friendly, but also as privacy-friendly uh, solution to empower the consumer who want to move into a digital payment, that they can do this in, in, uh, in, a, in a very private way. So, it, it, as I said, again, it's not one against the other, it will be a continuum. Great, thank you for that. I think we have time for just one more of this part, and then we move on to the, to the second part. So, um, a question then from Tristan Dijo. Um, Tristan, uh, Tristan, please, uh, your question. Thank you, good afternoon. Um, we published yesterday with the Veblen Institute uh, a report, uh, which is entitled A Digital Euro for a Better Monetary System, the case for public option. Uh, so my question is on this aspect, but we are, of course, uh, looking forward to discussing this report further with you. Um, looking at the work done by the Sweden's uh, Central Bank, we see that they consistently consider private and public uh, in the major reads or the yeah, it's, system, it's quite hard uh, to hear. We're struggling a little bit to try and hear what you're saying. I think the connection's not great. Could you just repeat that again, what you were saying, in just in terms of the question? Yes. Um, okay. If we look at the work done by the Sweden's uh, Central Bank, we see that they consider always private and uh, public intermediaries for the own CBDC. Uh, the ECB, on, on its part, always uh, only considers private uh, intermediaries for the digital euro. Uh, can you tell us what justifies uh, this difference uh, in your view? Uh, because the, posi the position of the RIFT Bank uh, is based on the fact that we can't expect the market to accommodate all needs. Uh, so why would it be different uh, in the case of the euro area? Thank you. Well, we, we believe that uh, um, uh, 
if you look to the whole of Europe and the distribution that you need to network that you need to have to reach all citizens, that the current supervised intermediaries are best positioned uh, to take uh, to take this role uh, towards uh, um, uh, the end user. Um, we are currently uh, um, um, about a couple of things. I think with the rule book, we try to make sure that it is. Uh, uh, the same everywhere, so that we can make sure that this is a public group, but it's the same all over the euro area uh, for for everybody. Uh, and uh, uh, next to that, we are considering whether it would make sense to have uh, next to the possibility to access a digital euro via, uh, for example, uh, the internet banking environment uh, uh, of the intermediary, also via a digital euro app that would be provided by the euro system. As I said, this is still uh, in consideration. Great, thanks for that. So I think in the interest of time, you were a bit slow to get going in terms of getting the questions, but then we, we had quite a wrap. I think just in the interest of time, we might move on to the next topic. So the second topic that people had uh, had looked at was the role of intermediaries was the one that we were talking about. And so maybe in that context, I mean, for the, the things that you had already discussed, um, uh, Evelyn, you know, what role can supervisory intermediaries uh, in, uh, in play? And then an obviously link to that is how would we distribute it to be here? How would it be distributed? So just on that, if we have any questions, to focus our attention for any initial questions from anybody on that. Yeah, we have a question from Conrad um, and then a question from Christian. So Conrad, please. Um, Hi, good day. Thank you very much. Um, my question is not necessarily about intermediaries, but more about uh, programmability. I uh, hope you wouldn't mind me asking this question. I uh, just had a look at your uh, publication that was issued on the 16th of January, uh, the Digital Euro Stock Take. You indicate that um, the Digital Euro uh, is not about programmable money. Right, so we know that means money that comes with any sort of baked in or, or constraints in terms of how it may be spent or, or, or timing in terms of when it should be spent. Uh, could you perhaps give us any sort of guarantees from it, uh, a design perspective that that will be the case and that this won't uh, change in the future? Perhaps I think this goes along with uh, regards to things like privacy and the preserving of, of uh, liberties and the, and the like. Thank you very much. Can I touch on that briefly, and then if we want to do a longer answer on that, we can go for it, yeah, just because I'm focusing on the role of each movie, so yeah. Sorry. Okay, I'll, I'll do a relatively quick. So, um, I think we have been assuming here that we will not do uh, any features uh, related to um, programmable money into the system. Um, how we would technically uh, ensure that we can never do this, uh, I would need to double check uh, and to see if we can uh, really have an answer on that already. Uh, but we, as, as I said, I, I also don't, or as we said, um, why would the euro system uh, think about programmable money? We are not thinking about programmable money. Programmable money would be seen as a sort of a voucher, for example. That's not what we do. The euro system issues money, uh, and um, we will do so the same for 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 a digital euro uh, as we uh, we also do for that for Thanks, Evelyn. Um, okay, so then Christian, you would raise your hand as well. Christian, Steve Muller from uh, Finance Watch. Christian, please. Uh, if you can. Thank you. Um, I mean, my, my question basically sort of potentially straddles uh, some of the uh, of the topics. If we look at um, the role of the intermediaries, you all mentioned both uh, sort of the whole um, onboarding process, uh, KYC, um, account uh, account keeping, etc., um, including the wallet now, um, which frankly sort of um begs the question from my point of view um the um design of the wallet um 
uh, is, is is something that is on the one hand sort of intimately linked clearly to to um, the data um, sort of the user data um, to um, data leakage potentially uh, and to privacy but on the other hand it is also sort of something that is goes to to a large extent uh, towards um, interoperability towards um, towards uh, standardization and the question here is, um, have you considered um, the possibility of um, uh, a centralized, uh, standardized um, uh, sort of wallet uh, to be provided uh, from the public side um, uh, to be uh, to be used by uh, any of the uh, by all the intermediaries, both public and private? And if so, sort of uh, what 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 are you, your arguments uh, pro and con? We lost a little bit here, but let me see if I uh, can, uh, can answer your question. So, um, the, the wallet that we, we do, just discussed, um, or I just said that we are considering, would be um, uh, a relatively thin wallet. So, in, in the core, we foresee that if you want to be onboardable on a digital euro, or you want to be able to hold it per euro, you need to go via a supervised intermediary um, that needs to do the KYC uh, and to do the uh, consumption monitoring. With the world that we would provide, uh, you, go, you could uh, uh, go through that platform uh, instead of going through uh, uh, a world that is provided by, uh, by your bank. Um, Having said that, the standardization and harmonization that you alluded to um, is very important. And part of the work that I mentioned under the scheme rule book would be around that. So to make sure that uh, whoever provides this wallet or this entry into uh, the digital euro, so where you can initiate your transactions, but also where you can see your balances and receive transactions, um, that we will uh, harmonize and standardize so that we really have a, a homogeneous way of interacting with the digital euro like you have for cash. So that it's not, uh, if you were one bank, it would look like this, and with the other bank, it would look like that, because it's, it's really important that it's, it's one user experience. Great. Uh, thanks, Marie, for that. And um, looking at the WebEx litter, I don't see any more hand raised. So we will tell you to keep some time towards the end in case there are any further questions people want to raise on other aspects that we haven't touched on here. So again, we try to focus on these two areas uh, specifically, um, because we kind of keep up you know, asking you which ones you wanted to hear or not. But are there any other questions that people have that they would like to ask now or comments they would like to make before we close the session? We have a couple of minutes left for questions or people have hot fresh. Great. I'm I'm kind of jumping on uh, on any of the raised hands I see now. Because Sorry, I, I don't want to I don't want to I don't want to dominate, but I'm a very opinionated person, as you can detect. I just want to make a comment, maybe or maybe a question on the the earlier response I got about the cash thing, and I, I find in a lot of institutions there's a story that people in the public are just naturally kind of moving to digital as if it was a kind of a passive thing. But I think we need to take seriously the fact that the private sector digital payments industry has been campaigning for digital very, very actively for the last like three decades. So when I hear the story that says, oh, well, this is sort of, sort of a kind of gradual move that we can't act against, I, it doesn't feel convincing to me. I feel like as the issuer of and the maintainer of the stability of the monetary system, the ECB has to have a kind of a bit more of a vigorous approach to protecting the cash system because on the other side of the equation the digital players do i will actively campaign against it okay it is a it's slightly a, a beyond my remit uh the only thing i can say uh is is that we are very committed to cash uh, uh and that we are uh, constantly updating cash with new security feature and so uh, we really foresee that cash will be there and also towards uh, uh, the future so we will make sure that uh, that it stays uh, uh, available. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you very much then. And really, thanks very much for your participation, everyone. Um, it's really very much appreciated. And uh, 
you know, it's uh, it's important for us to be able to, um, to provide you with this opportunity, but also for us to hear how you what you think and just like to type the comments that make there for us to hear what your, uh, what your views are. So just before we finish, uh, we have a um, we have a feedback survey which tremendously helps us in terms of how we would go forward with, with sessions like this. So if you uh, if you have the time, please just post completely anonymous. Um, and if you have the uh, moment, we will be we're all with you just to take the opportunity to just answer a couple of quick questions for us. And before I conclude the session, then just any closing remarks, um, Evelyn, anything you, you want to say that we haven't said already, or any thoughts? I'm not going to bring completely new things and not okay. allowing anybody to say something. But I, I would like to thank uh, all of you uh, who joined uh, this interaction. It's a very important uh, interaction for us. Um, we already appreciated your contributions uh, uh, in June. Um, we're happy that you were here. here. Um, and also, we are planning, uh, we said uh, that we would do it roughly every half year. So, I would say that somewhere around summer, uh, before summer, would be a good uh, a time frame again. Let's see if we can do this. Mm. Um, in general, we are uh, very open, so we try to be as transparent as possible. So, if you go to our website, um, you can find all kinds of information. We try to structure it in a way that if you go in, you first find more high-level overview, but you can dig further into quite a number of, of, of detail of, of considerations and work that we are doing. Um, and we would like to stay in touch uh, and to, to keep hearing uh, from you, from both the things that, uh, that, that are concerned, but also uh, uh, the value that you see that uh, which can do it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Evelyn and Jordan. And um, yeah, then from all of us, then just to wish you a very good evening. And uh, next time, thanks very much.